So what we've got now is a panel discussion and we're going to be talking about recognising we can do better. And to facilitate that discussion, we've got um, ESF board member Deb Martindale. And uh, Deb was basically born into a fire service family. She grew up around a fire station. She's been in emergency services since the moment she was born. Her father got um, fire service medal this week at Government House. It's her brother's in the fire service. It's in her blood. She's worked um, at Victoria Police. She has worked at CFA and she has done consulting to all sorts of um, agencies across the sector. So I was really pleased to ask Deb to facilitate this panel about um, recognising we can do better. After the panel, we'll have a bit of a time for a, a discussion before we come to a close with a little fun activity. So please welcome Deb Martindale. I feel like I might be arriving with two heads. Um, such is the sector that we all live and work and love in. Um, Thank you, Susan, and uh, what a massive day we've had today already, such, such amazing conversations and stories, and um, I'm not sure whether to be happy for you or, or a little bit alarmed for you that we have even more amazingness um, uh, this afternoon here in this conversation about um, shifting a little into recognising that we can do better and that we must do more. I would like to first introduce uh, the Reverend Jenny Wicking. I'm not doing this in, uh, in order. Hello, Jenny. Um, the Reverend Jenny Wicking uh, was ordained in 2009 following a long career in chaplaincy and family services with organisations including Monash University and Anglicare. She's currently, and I really love this, she's currently job sharing with her husband, the Reverend Tony Wicking. Um, and they are the joint priests in charge of the parish of Yarram at, um, for the Anglic Anglican Diocese of Gippsland. So um, I, c I look forward to hearing more about job sharing um, in, in, with your husband in the Anglican church. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, she is also a graduate of the G Gippsland Community Leadership Program, a grandparent to 15, and has spent much of her life and career in Gippsland. Jenny attended ESF's International Women's Day event in Bansdale, and so she joins us today as both herself, but also as a representative of the conversation that we had at that event um, not so long ago. Welcome, Jenny. <laughs> Sitting next to Jenny is Detective Sergeant Domenica Hunkin. Um, uh, Domenica is the officer in charge of the Wodonga Sexual Offences and Child Abuse Unit for Victoria Police. She relocated to the northeast of Victoria in 2009 to be closer to her family after working in Melbourne as both a detective and a uniformed general duties officer for 17 years. Domenica attended our event in the northeast of Victoria and so she is here both to represent herself um, but also the voices of the northeast um, women and men um, from our event uh, on Sunday. Welcome, Domenica. <laughs> um, I would like to um, particularly welcome, and welcome to Victoria, Dr Nikki Vincent. Um, for those of you, she, she might be an unfamiliar face, that's because she is new um, to our organisation, to our sector, uh, as Victoria's inaugural Commissioner for Gender Equality in the Public Sector. She has lots to tell us about, and it's a, a very exciting new role for the state. Um, Nikki, if I may call you Nikki, Nikki um, has most recently served as the South Australian Commissioner for Equal Opportunity and has held an extensive number of further roles. You should see her CV, um, including as Chair of the Australian Council of Human Rights Authorities, serving on the National Management Committee of Play by, Play by the Rules and as an Advisory Council Member for the Committee for Economic Development of Australia, or CEDA, if you know that organisation. She also holds an appointment as an Adjunct Associate Professor Professor of Uni South Australia's Business School. She has an extensive, as I said, and diverse career history and a really interesting um, story as well, um, which I've had the pleasure of listening to, and I hope you'll hear a little bit more about that today. Um, I'm sure you'll make her feel very welcome to our great state. Um, welcome, Nikki. Uh, and Tony Walker will be familiar to many of you. He is a registered paramedic and the Chief Executive Officer of Ambulance Victoria. 
He is also an executive member of the Global Resuscitation Alliance. He is an adjunct appointment as an associate professor in the College of Health and Biomedicine at Victoria University. He is a fellow of Paramedics Australia, a fellow of the Australian Institute of Ma Managers and Leaders. He's a fellow board member um, with me at the Emergency Services Foundation and uh, a d director at the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia and a number of other appointments like his colleague uh, next door to him. And we also welcome Tony today. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> so recognising we can and must do better. And I, I should say, originally that agenda item was we can do better, but it's turned into must, like just must do better. Um, I am going to start with, with you, Nikki, if I can, to help you just to uh, introduce yourselves to us. Um, you're, you're in a very warm room of lots of love here today. Um, but you're a relatively new Victorian with an amazing life and career story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, but also what gives you hope um, keeps you in roles such as the one that you're in to do better. Um, thank you. So um, human rights and equal, equal opportunity have been kind of at the heart of a lot of the roles that I've had, or most of the roles that I've had throughout my career. Um, I, st I came to Australia actually as a 10 pound pom the day after my 11th birthday, but I was um, sexually assaulted when I was 12 and grew up very, very fast after that. I ended up getting kicked out of home when I was 15 and working uh, in cafes nights to see myself through year 11 and 12. I got married when I was 18. I had four kids by the time I was 25. And then I thought, um, I should probably do something with my life, and, apart from all of the kids and the rest of it. So I went back to uni when the kids were zero, two, four, and six. I did quite well at university. I got a university medal for my undergraduate and honours year, but my, at the same time, my then husband told me he was having an affair and left me with the kids, so I was a single parent from that point on. Um, but getting the university made me really, a medal really made me think about what I should do with my life. Uh, I didn't realise I was smart, and I didn't realise I was smart at university because I was spending so much time with my kids and just dropping uh, assignments off and you know going to lectures and running out straight afterwards. Um, so I, I, I then I got some great jobs working in research, um, working in not, setting up not-for-profits, travelling all over the world with the World Health Organisation, went back to Adelaide, started up the Leaders Institute of South Australia, which is the equivalent of the Gippsland, yeah, like Leadership Victoria and all of the Victorian regionals, and I chaired the, um, the, the body that's the peak body for all of those leadership programs, so I know a lot about Gippsland. Um, and I ran, ours was called the Governor's Leadership Foundation Program. Um, and then got the job as commissioner, um, which is a very challenging role. I, um, as Commissioner for Equal Opportunity in South Australia, that I administered the Equal Opportunity Act. There were 15 grounds for discrimination, including um, sex discrimination and sexual harassment. And if you combine that with um, pregnancy discrimination and caring responsibility discrimination. You have a lot of discrimination against women there. Um, so that was our biggest one. Um, disability discrimination was also pretty up there as well. So I learned a lot in that role and that's what's kind of led me to this role. But I will add that when you have kids uh, as young as I did, by the age of 25, I became a grandmother at the age of 38. <laughs> I, um, I have uh, a 19 year old granddaughter who is currently in the police force as a cadet. Um, I've done uh, major reviews of SA police uh, force looking at sex discrimination, sexual harassment and predatory behaviour. I've also done that within the Metropolitan Fire Service in Adelaide and I've done that for the University of Adelaide, a little bit like Barry Ox done for um, Big Pole and so forth, the same sorts of things. Um, I have, she's the oldest, I have nine grandchildren, soon to be ten. Um, I also now have two stepkids and I have a foster daughter who was a respite living with me, um, or not living with me, um, coming to, me, to weekends uh, with me since she was 13. She's African. Um, and then last year during lockdown, she was badly beaten by her mother um, and I took her to hospital and she didn't go back home and so she's moved to Melbourne with me. Um, but I'm really excited about this new role and I can talk about what the role means uh, if you want later on. Well, we might... Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Jenny as well because Jenny... Jenny, you, you and Jenny should chat. Um, <laughs> but 
But I would like for everyone to know about the new uh, Gender Equality Act because I'm not sure if everybody is aware that we have a, a brand new piece of legislation that is particularly interesting and powerful and I, if you could introduce that to us it would really be yeah, helpful. Sure. So it's, yeah. It is really exciting. So the Gender Equality Act uh, comes into effect at the end of this month, 31st of March. It covers 300 organisations across Victoria. Uh, they are all the public service, uh, all of um, public related organisations, any, any organisations with an FTE over 50 um, or 50 plus, uh, all, all of the nine universities in Victoria and all local councils. So all of the emergency service organisations are included under the Gender Equality Act. And the, the good thing, the really unique things uh, about this are that it has teeth, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. The requirements under the Act, from the 31st of March this year, every organisation that's covered under the Act must begin to um, undertake gender impact assessments on every new pro program, policy or service that they deliver that has a significant and direct impact on the public. When you think about those 300 organisations and what they do, transport, infrastructure, you know, health, those, that is going to have a profound impact on what happens in Victoria in terms of our services to the public. Um, any or any uh, policy program or service that comes up for a review will also have to have a gender impact assessment done on it. So that's an ongoing obligation from now on, forever, until this Act is you know, repealed or whatever it is that they do with Acts when they come to the end of their lives because they're not necessary anymore. I can't see that happening for a while. Doesn't but happen. In perpetuity, <laughs> it will go on. Um, the second obligation is that from 30th of June, looking backwards, uh, and every four years after that, each organisation must undertake a um, gender equality audit in their organisation. There are seven key indicators for that, including sexual harassment, including uh, um, pay inequality or pay equality, um, and various other indicators around flexibility and the structure on section, sectional kind of sectionalisation of workforces and so forth. Um, once they have that audit data, they have to, as a requirement under the Act, take that data to their workforce, their governing body, their staff and all of their employee representatives and consult with them about what actions and strategies should come out, uh, should be um, created to address any inequality in that data. And those actions and strategies have to go into a gender equality action plan and that along with their audit data, must be submitted to me by the 31st of October this year. So there's quite a lot of stuff that organisations going to have to do in a very short space of time. Um, they then, two years later, they have to submit a progress report to me on the 31st of October 2023 and every four years after that. And the progress report, in the progress report, they must make um, substantial and material progress on their indicators. Um, there are also uh, uh, all of that data and all of those action plans and all of those progress reports will be published on our website. Everyone will be able to see what every organisation is doing. There's going to be no private, private kind of stuff happening. This is all going to be transparent and out there for everyone to have a look at and hold organisations to account for. And that's one of the astounding things about this Act. The other thing is that if organisations don't comply, I have good compliance power, so I can start negotiating with the organisation in an informal way, moving up to issuing them with a compliance notice, and find, or I can get the minister to intervene, I can name them, shame, shame them on the website, and if they still don't comply, I can go to VCAT and get an order for them to comply. So, you know, court's the final, the final uh, straw in all of this. Now, I hope I never have to do that, but I can assure you I will if I have to, and it's brilliant to have those powers. Um, we will also be developing procurement guidelines, so that's another way we'll impact, impact beyond the public sector and um, funding guidelines, and I also have dispute resolution powers as well, which I won't go into the depths of, but they're there. Mm. So it's going to create really powerful change, and I think the transparency and the compliance are two really key parts of the Act. Mm, absolutely, and um, I don't know about... Uh, all of you, but when I first started learning about this new act and those, the, particularly the transparency and the reporting um, processes for this sector, and we've been talking about 4.7% and 0% and uh, a few other statistics that have been of note today, I, I, you know, I really thought, wow, this is, this is an interesting time, you yeah. know, for everybody, but um, for this room, I think, yeah, yeah very interesting time. Um, Jenny. 
Yes. You are also um, someone with a story of being a relatively young mum yes. um, and an early career and then a, and a blossoming moment um, in terms of your recognition of self, you know, that, that you um, are an amazing leader in your community. Um, what made you, first of all, what made you put your hand up from the Gippsland event to come here today? Well, actually, I didn't put my hand up. <laughs> So, um, <coughs> who dobbed you in then? Shall yeah, we go? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, you get a nudge when something happens, and yeah. and Suzanne Suzanne got up and said, "There's a, a place for somebody to put their hand up," and I sort of, nah, nah, no. And I think you might have said it about four times, Suzanne. And I finally, the third time, I thought, well, if somebody else thinks I can, mm -hmm. they will. And it was Emma from Lifesaver life-saving at Victoria that was there. She gone. I said, if you think I should, put my name in, you know. So she did and it got drawn out. So I'm here. Um, mainly I grew up in a small region. I've grew up, grown up in regional Victoria, Gippsland area all my life. Except at 15 and a half, the doctor said, it's either your mother or you leave the house. And I thought, I'm not looking after seven more kids again. I'm going. So I got a job looking after children in Melbourne. And that was a major shift for me. You know, like, you imagine 16-year-old suddenly going, and you could go out to the clubs without having a boy take you. <laughs> and, uh, and you could be out. So it was really good. Um, I came back to Jembrook, was my hometown, married, and fell right back into that social norm of those times, mm. but still asked questions. So I just travelled around and a bit like um, uh, Nikki, um, my husband and I separated, he had an affair and that's a real life change, especially when you're the one that's labelled as the problem and not him. Mm. And um, so I left and uh, went on my own. I had to leave my three children, they're much older, but they chose to stay with, in Jembrook. So um, I moved out and went to Melbourne to work and started studying mm. and that was a big change for me. Mm. But you sort of, I think a bit like what Nikki was saying, <clears throat> you just sort of go along with the flow. You know, I just study, I'm working at Monash, being challenged with international students' way of living and you sort of do your degree and you really don't think much of it, you just keep going and going. And then I did the Gippsland Community Leadership Program. Mm. <clears throat> and that was a huge shift for me. The, um, it's similar to the Williamson program, if anyone knows that. A few nods. And um, Wayne Casey and, oh, John, can't think of his last name. Hutchinson brought it back to Gippsland. And I did it in 1998. Mm. And I'd been at Monash then for uh, 11 years. Mm. And um, a woman spoke, her name was Di, and she actually spoke spoke to us and said she became a leader when she um, and her father encouraged her. Her father said that he noticed that when she played in the sandpit she would order people around and, you know, <laughs> and he encouraged her and I thought gee when I used to do that I used to get into trouble. Mm. So um, her story empowered me and I think that's the message that I want to give we need to be telling our stories, our real stories. Like Monique has done today and like Nikki and I, we need to say this is what it's been like. My years at Warrigal Regional with um, the uh, chaplain were mind-blowing. Mm. And the only thing that I would like to say, and I already said to Susan, I'd love to see some of those young girls sitting amongst us today mm. because yeah. they need to hear our stories. Yeah. They need to hear the struggle. And um, so I used to say to the young people, um, you know Nemo? Everyone remember that movie, Nemo? Finding Nemo, that's it, thanks. And uh, Dory, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> and for one part in that movie, they had to swim through the deep ravine. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the message, is just keep swimming and don't look back. Mm. Thanks, Jenny. That's really great. And, and also, I think we should all do a little uh, note that something happened in 1998. 
Yes. Have you noticed that? It keeps coming up. It says some, something happened in 1998 for us all here. Um, Domenica, um, would you be able to share something that came up for you or that you particularly sort of resonated with on Sunday at the um, Wangaratta event? What? what? Yeah, um, so uh, it was such a wonderful day. That was the first time I ever really participated with anything like that. And what I loved is that it was a room full of like-minded people. Um, and so I'm sort of new into this journey of really making my mark within Victoria Police and even just as a mum. So what I loved about the day was it was almost the same thing that I was also thinking that, you know, we need to recognise the difference between men and women, mm. um, but not just men and women, but us individually. Um, and we need to recognise that this is not just one way of doing things, but many ways of doing things um, and sort of try to understand why is it that women are saying no to applying for that position, applying for that promotion or moving forward. We need to hear what are their limitations? Why, why is it that they're saying no? Is it because they've got two young kids at home or they can't attend that course because it doesn't suit that day? Um, or is it their self-belief? Do they need that support or that, that encouragement? Do they need more flexibility? So um, it was sort of listening to those stories that we, and I think someone mentioned it earlier, we need to um, not say no. We need sometimes to push those women out there and say, yeah, of course you can do it. Go out there and think big and strive for what you really want. Mm. Um, and it sort of just kept popping up throughout the day and it was amazing. Mm. Yeah, and, and it is amazing, that, that theme of... Uh, belief in yourself yep. um, for whatever reason that that belief is diminished or not enough or wavering yeah yeah, yeah. very palpable today too um, can you tell us a little bit about a, a time in your career or a juncture or a, or a person who really helped you to propel or to believe in yourself in your own career um, I can't say there was one person um, there's been many people throughout my whole career um, men and women but I think the most defining moment for me was um, I was a detective at a crime unit here in Melbourne and I was part-time. I'd just come back from, work, uh, from that leave and I was working five days a fortnight, so not a lot of days, but um, we were investigating quite high-profile investigations. Um, and um, I wasn't sort of feeling part of the group. They were, they were having briefings without me. By the time I come back to work, I'd missed everything, wasn't mm quite sure what was happening mm. um, and we were given tasks and the tasks were minuscule they were just you know very you know not um, complex not really um, important jobs and I was sitting here going I'm a detective like all of you and here I am just because I'm part-time um, I've been just given these minor jobs um, and then there were other women that were coming into um, the sector that were of the same they were sort of being treated the same and feeling the same. And we sort of sat down and like, oh, so it's not just me. This is actual thing. Like mm. we're feeling um, like a minority or are, are we being punished or we're not sure what it is. So I think with the force of being, you know, a collective um, and, um, you know, we chose to challenge mm. um, and we went forward and we spoke to our manager and explained how we were feeling. Um, and what we sort of identified was that, these people, these supervisors, weren't doing it because they were being malicious or biased, but they thought they were actually doing us a favour. Yeah. And we were like, no, we're, we want to um, we want to contribute. We want to be part of the team. We, we, when we leave home, we don't want to think babies. We want to have an adult conversation and use our brains because we have so much to offer and give. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, my colleagues... Um, I guess my internal drive, listening to other women, feeling the same thing and just moving forward together as a, as a team. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know that um, exact conversation happened at our table earlier this morning too, that sort of people, assumptions we make about all of the different people who we work with and the backgrounds or otherwise that we don't know or know about um, people. So really great example of the tyranny of part-time sometimes. Um, yes. Um, I want to come back to you. I'm just putting you on notice um, about being a, a regular person in the workforce because I want to ask Tony um, to uh, tell us a little bit about the, the challenges that have led to you inviting um, the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission 
if you don't know the acronym VERIOC, that's the big long name that's, uh, that's coming around that. And, and many of us are not strangers to a VERIOC um, review and a process, but, but AV is just setting out um, in that context. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenges there and what's, um, what's ahead of you? Yes, certainly. So um, Ambulance is an interesting beast in some ways, that we've, as an organisation, um, often been put on a bit of a pedestal amongst the other emergency services because of the <coughs> gender balance within our organisation. And we've got close to 50% women in frontline roles in the organisation. And, um, and I think when you're compared to other organisations that have much less, mm. you know, we do get put up on this pedestal. And what's been interesting for us is that's not been something we deliberately went out and did. What we did 15 years ago was we changed the way we recruit. And we recruit directly from university. And universities create diverse graduates. Mm. And so we were drawing from a different pool of people than historically we may be employed when we were doing it, um, uh, employing people that maybe looked exactly like I do. Yeah. So um, that's been an interesting journey for us. And um, you know, I've got a, a really good board strongly focused on saying, OK, that's great. We've got these, uh, this, this balance occurring at the front line, but you know, how are we going in broader leadership? We've um, got around 38% women in front line, also in leadership roles in the organisation. But as you keep breaking that down, what becomes clear is, the higher up the organisation you go, particularly in the operations stream, that's not the case. Yeah. And so, so I think you know, if you look across the organisation, this is the problem of dilution. You dilute, your figures tell a different story to what when you actually look at the, the various streams. Mm. And for those of you who know my board chair, Ken Lay, you know, I'd be talking about the growth we're seeing, for example, in, in leadership uh, in women in our organisation. And Ken would rightly challenge me, great, now Tony, help me understand how many women we've got working on the helicopter. And you know, I'd be sitting there going, well, actually, we don't have any women working on the helicopter. We do now. Um, um, you could have Faye. Yeah, so it was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was, it's interesting. We've been doing quite a bit of work to look at the sort of streams in our organisation. So if you looked at us and we're going, OK, we thought we were doing a pretty good job. We thought that we were getting better as an organisation. And then last year, um, uh, you, you, many of you would have seen, there was an article that Wendy Tui wrote in The Age. Uh, where a number of incredibly brave women in our organisation came forward and told some stories. I've got to say I was deeply distressed by what I read because that wasn't the organisation that I thought we had. Mm. Um, and I've tested myself and challenged myself on many occasions since then about what was it we missed because <coughs> for me, um, um, you know, we, we thought we were doing better than that. Mm. And what it really highlighted straight away um, to, to, to me and to, to Ken was that... Um, um, this is real because those are the stories that women are telling us, first of all. So regardless of what I think of my organisation and what I think what's going on, um, this is people's experience, first of all. And we respect it and we acknowledge it and we have to do something about it. And importantly, we don't understand what's driving it. And so to, and, and emergency services are good at this. We get into fixing mode and we go, oh, this is what's driving this, we'll fix it. Mm. We don't know. Mm. And so Ken and I agreed within 24 hours, we met with uh, uh, Commissioner Hilton and engaged Berriog to do a, a deep review of our organisation. Mm. And the story this morning, it was wonderful to hear our, our CFA colleague talk this morning about the experiences. And we spent um, a good two months with Berriog making sure that we have locked in the fact this report will be made publicly available, that um, if I get hit by a truck tomorrow and Ken does, it doesn't matter. Um, it has been set up so that uh, our commitments, which are clear and strong, um, the review will be published in November of this year. It will be publicly made available. I've already accepted that whatever the recommendations are, we will implement those recommendations. Um, we've commissioned Berrioc to work with us to help us implement the recommendations. Because one of the great things, we've got some wonderful colleagues in Victoria Police who've been through this. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to a number of our, our colleagues at VicPol about you know, what, what did they learn that we could take to ensure that um, uh, we don't just get a, a document, that we've then got to try and work our way through to implement. Veroc will help us implement, and we've also commissioned them to audit us at 18 months and to make that report public as well. Mm. So hold to me, yep. the board and my executive and everyone in the organisation accountable. So um, it's, it's, it's challenged us because I think what it's, well, what it's highlighted to us is that we aren't a perfect organisation. Um, we have the challenges that every organisation has mm. um, and importantly if we're serious about changing it and making it better we have to understand what is actually driving it, what is, what is the issue in, uh, that fundamentally is occurring in an organisation 
and importantly, what real and meaningful change we have to make. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I, I'm of a view, and this, is, this will be tested through the very work, mm -hmm. but I'm of a view that um, we, have, we have got this critical mass now of women in our organisation who have said enough. Yeah. Uh, we have, and in the last five years, we've grown our workforce by 50%. The majority of them are women under the age of 30. Um, they are looking for a different experience to the experience I was looking for when I joined Ambulance Victoria. They are looking for an experience, uh, and not just women but men, around flexibility yep. and uh, uh, opportunities to, um, to uh, look at uh, work life and, uh, in a different way to, uh, to my privileged view. I grew up in a privileged environment. Mm -hmm. I often get asked the question of how I became CEO and I often answer it, but I said yes to opportunities. I could say yes to opportunities because I had a wife who was at home looking after my kids. Yeah. And I remarried a couple of you a few years back and have got a five-year-old daughter at home now. And it was really interesting. I thought I'd moved on in my thinking of the world. Well, it was really interesting when my daughter was born and my wife was talking about going back to work and we were trying to work out how that was going to be done. My unconscious biases were absolutely clear. Let me tell you, they were quickly adjusted. Um, but they, <laughs> they were clear. So I worked flexibly. So I've got a flexible work arrangement to work, uh, uh, um, uh, take working one day a week from home, mm -hmm. caring for my daughter. Um, and that was, I was, I was anxious to have that conversation with my board chair about, I shouldn't be giving people to know Ken Lay, but I was anxious about it. It was really interesting when I had the conversation. It was like, yeah, of course, and it's the best thing I've ever done. So you know, mm. I, and, I, and I, but I'm again, in some ways, privileged in the sense that you know, as the, the head of an organisation, you know, I can pull those levers. What we now need to look at is actually, what, what, why can't everyone in my organisation have the same experience mm. I had? Mm. So it's going to be a very interesting time. I think it'll fundamentally change us. It's going to challenge us. Um, it's because uh, you know we're not going to back away from this. We're leaning into it. It is. Uh, we are genuinely going to make the changes that are in there, but it's going to be painful for us, mm. but it's going to change us, I think, forever. Mm. That's really bold and, and necessary, yeah. Um, I want to stay on that topic, if I could, because, um, Nikki, you, you've, you're no stranger to these sorts of reviews. You've conducted them yourselves and you've seen the, re the response and the work that comes afterwards. And, and I guess, Dominica, you, you're like a living, breathing person in an organisation that's been working through all of this as well and, and I, I'm curious about what impact you've experienced um, either way, anyway, um, as, a, as an employee of an organisation who's been through a, a review and Nikki I'm curious about what your insight is in, into the, the impact of these reviews. You know there's the doing but what happens afterwards? What would you say there? Well, um, like um, Theriok, when we undertook the independent review of SA Police, um, the commitment was from the Commissioner Grant Stevens, we will implement every one of the 38 recommendations that we made. And then we um, also, um, and that was transparent, the um, report and review was published and we then audited, we assisted and then audited um, SAPOL for the three following three years and every one of those reports was publicly, um, made public as well. Um, look, I think, um, I think we'd all agree that, uh, in, including uh, Grant Stevens, who um, has sat on many panels with me, so I think we've been, we, we know what we can say publicly, <laughs> um, he, that they have implemented almost all of the recommendations by the time we finished reviewing and they were, they had uh, made good progress in starting. Um, right. They still had an incredibly long way to go to get the kind of cultural change in the rank and file right the way down that is required. They also have some really, um, really big limiters in that they cannot do any lateral recruitment into the organisation. So their pipeline, and it's the same for the fire service uh, in, um, in South Australia as well, and I'm assuming for other sort of organisations in Victoria, um, if you can't recruit in from outside, then you have to be growing your pipeline all the way up. And if you don't have enough women in there, that's the, the change isn't going to happen for a very long time. Yeah. And, you know, until we have women in positions of leadership, we aren't going to have the change that we need to see happen. So that's a really big limiter. Mm. I think some of the um, culture, so some of... The men were just like, oh, it's, it was constantly said to me, oh, the pendulum swung too far. If I hear that again, I'm oh, crazy. <laughs> um, because men felt like, and in fact, I was doing a leaders forum for SAPOL one time, and a, man, a leader in SAPOL stood up and said, I think the pendulum swung too far, and now we've got 
we, now we've got gender bias going the other way. Um, um, everyone <laughs> apologised to me afterwards, including the Commissioner, but anyway. So there is still a lot of that kind of thinking in the organisation and a lot of women who've struggled to meet the standards and get ahead in those organisations on men's terms, if you like, and they've fought the battles and, you know, they've got ahead nevertheless, don't, also don't want the organisation to be changed mm. um, because that weakens their position. So there's a lot of issues, I think, uh, in these male-dominated paramilitary command and control environments. Um, and I think that just the culture of command and control, which is absolutely necessary for emergency services when you are in an emergency situation, but it's being able to switch that off and behave like a normal organisation that's not about command and control, so you can have truth spoken to power, which, I mean, lots of organisations are command and control, even though they're not um, emergency services. <laughs> So, they don't have um, lights and sirens, though. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it's that being able to, to um, have, a, have a, um, a less power and control, kind of command and control situation inside the operation mm. of the organisation that I think makes it easier um, to create the culture change. Mm. And th I guess we're just talking about the pace of change. And, mm -hmm. and I wonder, you know, D Domenico, have you... Have you felt the impact of the review that Vic Pohl went through, or is it m more subtle? Is, is there, can you see it? No, I definitely felt the impact um, of the review. Um, but to put some context into where I felt it was, um, and I was saying to my table, um, I'm first generation Australian, so my parents are immigrants. Um, and the first time I ever sort of really saw and felt gender bias or gender discrimination was in my home. Um, you know, my parents um, have roles, so, you know, the women are in the kitchen. And the men, you know, they eat and they go to bed, like. Mm. Um, and so when I joined Victoria Police, I kept it a secret because my parents would never have approved. Um, and then it got to a point that I had to go to the academy for five months and I had to tell them where I was going. <laughs> wouldn't be home by ten. a missing person. <laughs> So I had to tell them, and still to this day, that gender bias is still there. Like, my dad still does not know what I do. Like, family friends will ask them, oh, is your daughter still on the police force? And they say, yes, um, I think she's a traffic cop. So they still think I'm on Swanson Street um, directing traffic. So they have no idea. So I guess when the VUROC um, commenced, um, I remember being asked, you know, tell me, you know, has anything ever happened to you? And I remember thinking, well, no, it, I, I don't think I've ever seen it. I've never been, I've experienced it. But then when you think about it, mm. you're like, well, yes, of course I have. Mm. Um, and what was great about the report was it highlighted what the issues were that were occurring because we weren't aware to the full extent what was happening. You can only really explain to what was happening in your station or with your colleagues. So it made, um, made us aware of what was happening across the whole organisation. And for me personally, I think it's um, encouraged me to um, not be a bystander from now onwards. Mm. If I see something like that, um, I will call it out because um, it is not on. It's not acceptable. Um, mm. And we need to be a leader and to make that change for the future. Um, and so the other thing that I've actually enjoyed since the, the findings is not just calling it out, but there's not going to be a repercussion. Because I think as a female, that's what it is. We were like, well, that's going to impact my career. That's going to ruin my reputation. But it's not now. So I sort of feel brave enough that if I see something that's unacceptable, that I can actually do something about it. No, it's fantastic. And, and um, uh, I guess just the power of your voice, but then the support crew and the systems around you to know that your voice is um, uh, for good and will go somewhere and not bounce back in your face. Um, yeah, really, really powerful. Please, like yeah. Um, the, it's really interesting what you said, Dominica, around um, not, not realising that you'd experienced some of those things. And in fact, when we um, did our survey of um, SA Police, and I know this was the same for Virioc's review of VicPol, um, we had a, have you ever um, been sexually harassed? Have you ever experienced sexual uh, sex discrimination? And we got yes and no's. And that was 1%, one proportion. And then we listed all the sexual harassment kind of behaviours that you could have experienced. So we got a totally different statistic because people didn't actually realise what sexual harassment was. And so it was astonishing. 
Um, and although the prevalence of sexual harassment wasn't that different from other organisations, the difference in SAPOL was the predatory sexual harassment was much higher, 20% higher. So that's bosses predating on Yuck. people. That's incredibly disempowering. Mm. And it was impacting people's careers if they reported it. Mm. Mm. Can you please thank our wonderful panel? Thank you.